I see. You found our little hiding spot in the universe. Don't get too comfortable. This is a place where you will find those with an experience that's out of this world. Or possibly deep within your life. I welcome you to the Oracles with James Tyson. Lean forward and listen. We will pull you into a supernatural journey with guests from around the world, each one experiencing some of the most extraordinary phenomena this wee planet has to offer. Now, here are the Oracles with James Tyson. Thank you, Liam, and thank you, listener, for tuning into this episode of the Oracles with James Tyson. Tis I, James Tyson, and today I bring you Thomas Steenberg. Check him out at thomassteenberg.com. You see the type of work that he is doing. And plus, if you've ever seen a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch, that's the place to report it. Thomas Steenberg. Com. Thomas has been interested in Sasquatch probably from the first time he heard about him when he was five or six years old out in a small town in Ontario. A little more interested in Loch Ness Monster back then, but he figured he wasn't ever going to be moving to Scotland, so he kind of hung his hat on the North American big cryptid, which we call, in this side of the world anyway, Sasquatch, or you may know him as Bigfoot, where you live. Sasquatch is that kind of Western Canada, Pacific Northwest term for Bigfoot. And it's a bastardized enunciation of the original native word for it, which we'll get into. Actually, we're going to talk about that and how it became known as that term and that enunciation, as opposed to what the real name is for Sasquatch. You've, um, I shouldn't say the real name, the, the original name that the... Uh, the Aboriginal population of the First Nations actually called our big hairy friend. He has been known, not Bigfoot or Sasquatch, but Thomas has been uh, called one of the original Squatch Fathers, um, one of the original investigators. He's been doing this uh, as a young man back in 1978. Uh, he's been researching pretty much um, with and around some of the original fellows, uh, Rene de Hinden, guys like who have been investigating since the 50s, as Thomas, who grew up in small town Ontario, moved out to Western Canada uh, in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, he got transferred out there and posted with the Canadian military back, oh, you know, I can't be in the 70s. And he, he was in the uh, foothills of the Rocky Mountains and was fascinated with what kind of big hairy beasts, if anybody had been reporting them, because, you know, you hear about the rainforests of British Columbia and, and down into Washington and Oregon. But he was wondering if anyone actually had ever seen them in Alberta. So uh, going a little bit outside of the norm, he actually put an ad in the paper and said, you know, if anybody ever seen one of these, why don't you give me a call? Because I'm really interested in it. And of course, he got a lot of people responding. And from then, the bug really, really hit. And he started compiling all the reports and categorizing it and researching what he could when he could get out into the bush himself and following up on those reports. And he still does it to this day, the best he can. He's living here in uh, Lower Mainland, just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, about an hour drive to the east and literally 45 minutes east of where he lives. Sasquatch is being, as has been seen for over 100 years. Uh, we discussed on the show uh, his uh, Thomas's start in the research um, and his books. Now, he had, his, I think his first book was back in 1989. It was The Sasquatch in Alberta. And of course, that was based on a lot of those uh, original reports that he was getting in the mail when he, he posted the ad. His next book, uh, Sasquatch Bigfoot, The Continuing Mystery, came out a few years later. His last book now is in search of giants and well it's, it's about 15 oh it's almost 20 years old now uh, but and also co-authored a few other books one coming out i think sasquatch in british columbia uh about five six seven years ago 
but there's also written numerous articles on it. You've probably heard him on a number of television documentaries, radio documentaries. And again, one of the last of the old school investigators who was privy to those stories and was friends with those old guys who were out there clunking through the wilderness back in the 50s and 60s. This is a puzzle that he continues to look after. He is skeptical. He is a a very, very interesting gentleman. He uh, doesn't take everything at face value because he's, you know, learned over 40 some years of doing this that it's uh, get a little bit of information today and hang your hat on it and open your next email up and your what you believed is completely blown out of the water. Again, go to his website, uh, which is a reporting place too, is Thomas Steenberg. Dot com that Steenberg is S T E E N B U R G Thomas Steenberg dot com and uh, see the types of things that he does. He's also, if you want to hear him, he's quite often on with Julie Wrench on Monster X Radio and the show On the Shoulders of Giants, and you'll find that on Blog Talk or most other places that you'll you'll bump into a podcast. Again, that's Monster X Radio, On the Shoulders of Giants. He and Julie Wrench, the uh, host of that show, um, provide updates quite often on what's going on in uh, the Bigfoot uh, community and whatever new research pops up. So again, find, you can find him on there. I think there's going to be a link on his his website to that uh, podcast to uh, Monster X Radio. Look at me promoting somebody else's podcast. Yes, I do that. <laughs> it's because we're all friends and we all get along and we all want you to have access to as much information as you can. And, and these authors, Thomas is a very cool guy. I want you to uh, sit back, put your feet up, grab your pipe and your slippers, even for the guys who are listening, do the same thing and listen to what Thomas has to say. Thomas, how are you today? I'm doing just fine, sir. Just fine. Excellent. I've been uh, really looking forward to this uh, and for a couple of reasons. One, I'm a, I'm a British Columbia kid, and you actually don't live that far from me. And the things we're going to be talking about are all relative to uh, re- basically the Pacific Northwest in Alberta. Uh, it was fascinating. Um, and for my listener, if you want to go uh, listen along or play along at home, go to thomassteenberg.com, thomassteenberg.com, um, common spelling, S-T-E-N-B-U-R-G, thomassteenberg.com. And check out the books he has, too. Uh, get, uh, his first book, Sasquatch in Alberta, um, Sasquatch Bigfoot, Continuing Mystery, and In Search of Giants, Bigfoot Sasquatch Encounters. And that's really what I want to get into a little bit later is the encounters that you've, uh, you have know, reporting. But when did you start getting into this, Thomas? Oh, well, my interest in the Sasquatch goes way back to when I was a small boy growing up in the 1960s. Um, uh, basically, it all started when my one night my parents uh, slapped down on the table in front of my sister and me an old Reader's Digest hardcover book, you know, for education purposes. Yeah. And in that book, you had chapters on this, that, volcanoes, tornadoes, wildlife, blah, blah, blah. And you had its usual, you know, section on the dinosaurs, complete with those old beautiful paintings, you know, T-Rex standing upright, dragging his tail, brontosaurus being so heavy he can't gas to live in water, things they know are not true today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in the middle of that dinosaur section was a little two-page article with three blurry black-and-white pictures titled The Thing in Loch Ness. I don't know, man. I must have read that thing a hundred times start pestering my parents about th- about it and trying to get more information. They ended up giving me a library card and I, of course, going in. I knew at a very young age I was never going to move to Scotland. <laughs> so uh, uh, I started reading about this thing in Western Canada called the Sasquatch. But what I think I really, really, really did it was uh, not too long after that, again, the mid-60s, on a school night when I should have been asleep in bed and come down, I can't remember why I came downstairs and my parents were watching something on the old black and white TV and I walked into the living room figuring I'd get the usual, hey, what are you doing up, lad? You should be in bed, blah, 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 you know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, 
No, he said, you know, the lad's interest in this kind of thing. Well, let him watch this. And, of course, my mother goes, no, no, I don't think he should. He may have bad dreams or something. And what they were watching was that old Hammer horror film starring Peter Cushing, the abominable snowman in the Himalayas. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Sasquatch from that day on. <laughs> oh, that's great. So you actually started off with what we would call now cryptozoology. You're getting into all the mysterious, you know, Mo uh, mo I hate to say monsters because we don't. We're just we're throwing that label on a bunch of things we don't know. But uh, these these things out there, aren't you glad you you left the uh, curse of o or the Oak Island uh, Reader's Digest version to uh, the brothers who are out there digging a hole right now? Or you'd be off on that tangent uh, if they drop that <laughs> that uh, Reader's Digest down on you. But uh, yeah, the, the Bigfoot is fascinating for me because I grew up with it. I'm in the Lower Mainland, British Columbia. Uh, and, you know, you just have to go, well, for me, I'm out on, right on the coast, so, you know, an hour east of here up to a town called Hope and then beyond Hope. Uh, <laughs> and you see, you know, welcome to Sasquatch this. You got the Sasquatch Inn out on the, out the highway in the north end uh, out in that area. Um, it's, it, it's just something that we've grown up with uh, here. And I've always had that interest to it. I never was lucky enough to actually get, um, you know, my parents had a little tent trailer. And we used to go in these tent trailer groups, like a little gang of tent trailer people do all through the interior of British Columbia. And, you know, it was always in the back of your head, you know, don't wander too off, too far off from uh, the camp or the Bigfoot. Or, it was always Sasquatch is going to get you. So it kept the kids close to the camp. Uh, but, you know, I, I've always been interested in that. And there's you actually, you know, as, as a kid, too, doing the, basically the same thing I was doing. Well, did you actually, um, as a kid, as you grew up, now you went, um, you were in the Canadian military for a while, right? The PPCLI, the Princess, Pe Princess Patricia Canadian Light Infantry? Yes, 1st Battalion, which was stationed in Calgary at the time, yes. Calgary, oh. Alberta. Yeah, so... You know, you've got some outdoors background. You've, you know, you've, you've grown up here, you, you, and you're basically, you got some good tracking background. You've got uh, a survival, survivalist background, and you, and you understand uh, one of those things that um, a lot of people don't, if unless you've been out working, working uh, in the evening in the bush, is there's that light change at night and morning where everything just looks the same. And uh, it's, it's you know, if you're going to build an OP or bunk down for the night, or if you're an animal crossing the highway, it's always that time where every, all the colors start looking the same. And uh, with that kind of background and that interest in, in Bigfoot and the outdoors and, or, uh, and Sasquatch, does that kind of catapult you a little bit further into um, connecting a little more with the land itself and being able to get out there and poke around and being a little more confident uh, trucking through the bush uh, than I was uh, when I was younger and uh, you know, afraid to come around a corner and see my own shadow. Well, uh, to me, uh, going out every time I go out, I'm always wondering if the darn thing exists or not. And that's basically what it's still all about. I mean, uh, in 40 years of research and searching I may have only had a fleeting glimpse myself once and uh, I've always had the same philosophy uh, since the day I started I started officially looking into this in the late 1970s and I always had the same philosophy and that philosophy has always been stick to the fact and never deviate from the facts and I, uh, I'm, I, I guess a lot of people consider me one of the last of the old guard now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so many people now, they go out and they, and you, you know, the internet and things like that. Um, uh, well, let's face it, it's 95% garbage. Yeah. I mean, it's people, people can't go out their back doors without running into Sasquatch everywhere. And uh, we're seeing signs of Sasquatch everywhere. And quite frankly, it's, it's overwhelmingly an example of letting their imaginations run away with them. Yeah, I, I, I like to look at evidence and whether or not the, this this creature does indeed exist. And that I'm still, as far as I'm concerned, we're still on stage one, the same stage we were at in the late 1950s. Yeah, a lot of you. 
you know, one of the quote Rene de Hinden. Now, uh, for those the listener who doesn't know who that is, he was a uh, fellow from Switzerland who moved to Western Canada here back in the fifties, and he became fascinated with it, and he was out trekking through the bush, and and he his, one of his quotes was, you know, he's. Uh, Research the thing for forty years has never seen one, and that alone says something. So, well, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and he had a very logical mind. He never had. Uh, he never went beyond grade five in education when he migrated to Calgary, Calgary Alberta, in nineteen fifty-five. He um, was sitting down. He was working at a dairy farm, and he was sitting down with the owner of the dairy farm. And they just happened to be listening to the CBC radio, and there was a story that came on about the Daily Mail expedition in the Himalayas looking for the Eddy, or the abominable snowman, as they called it in the media quite a bit in those days. And Rennie turned to the, uh, the, the farmer he worked for and said, geez, wouldn't it be great to go along on something like that? And the farmer said, well, you don't need to go all the way over there. They got something like it in British Columbia, and that's how Rene got out. <laughs> yeah, and that was it. He's crossing the Rocky Mountains over to BC to see if he can find the the British Columbia Yeti on his own. That's fascinating. Yeah, quite so. I was in Calgary too when I started. And I looked at the Rocky Mountains for the first time in my life, and I remember they were beautiful. It looked like a fake movie drop. They were so clear. And I thought to myself, well, there's no wall between British Columbia and Alberta. If they've been seen in eastern BC, they got to be seen here too. Mm-hmm. So I started off taking out uh, small newspaper ads and basic media in around southern Alberta, and it was really quite simple. Sasquatch, if you believe you have seen this creature, contact Thomas Steenberg and the phone number. And I didn't expect much result, but I swear to God, my phone was ringing almost on a daily basis. Oh, that's perfect. I know from working in northern Alberta, um, one of the... Uh, we were basically mile zero of the Mackenzie Highway, the town I was a policeman in, and it's all short scrub, you know, growing up in the lower mainland, British Columbia, with big trees going up there to trees that seem to be half the size of a regular tree. There was sightings up there. The First Nations people said, oh, yeah, they're all over the place. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, they all over British Columbia, northern Alberta, and uh, there's even reports in northern Manitoba and Ontario. But growing up in Ontario as a kid, I never heard of anything except for a uh, creature that had the local name Old Yellowtop in the Cobalt region. I grew up believing the Sasquatch is a west coast phenomenon, basically the Rocky, east slopes of the Rocky Mountains west. But I've now expanded my, um, you know, good researchers and people like Don Keating and and others who have done research in the East got me thinking twice about that now, too. Well, you know, you talk about old Yellowtop in Ontario, that's, it's always described as a Sasquatch-like creature uh, around that Cobalt, Ontario area. Uh, Correct. And it was called old Yellowtop because it had a, basically a, uh, a, a small streak of white hair on the top of its head and then halfway down its back. And most of the sightings were in the 40s, 50s. The last official sighting I know of Old Yellow Top was 1970. And the, the men in the bus who saw the thing said it looked like he had seen better days. So Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. And I think that was, uh, it was a bunch of coal miners uh, mm-hmm. um, either coming to or from work. And, they, you know, when you got a group of 20-plus people looking out the window at them, you're kind of thinking, oh, they, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, an odd thing uh, if you're going to fake a story to get uh, 20 some people together and for, out of the blue say they saw something like that so that's you know it's, it was interesting well, yeah. and the driver almost lost control of the bus when it crossed in front of him so yeah so. yeah <laughs> it gets your attention so you know stories like that Thomas those are the ones that um, as an investigator trained in a, in a different way to investigate things um, those are the ones I throw a lot of weight on those are the kind that kind of stick out, like saying, "Yeah, what, what is the, what is the end game here?" They're all not, they're not making, trying to make money out of this. They're not. Uh, they're basically they're saying this and becoming a bit of a laughing stock, or, or you know, raise the eyebrow at the dinner table with your your nephew or something. But uh, yeah, that would. There's no reason, legit reason, I should say. I shouldn't say legit. I, I, there's no real reason somebody would make up a story like that. 
wouldn't think so, but it's a lot different, I've noticed, than when I started. Uh, and one, it's, it's basically one of the drawbacks of modern convenience of the Internet. Those in the United States, like finding Bigfoot. And it's had one major drawback. It's made a soapbox for every snake oil salesman out there. Oh, yeah. And there are a lot of people today, especially in the U.S., who are... You know, just making up stories because they've made seeing a Sasquatch become trendy. I mean, when I started, you almost had to pry information from a witness because they're afraid of ridicule. It's still that way in Canada for the most part. But unfortunately, for instance, I, I, I get calls all the time from people who tell me these incredible tales and they want me to get them in contact with the show. And I said, well, that's a red flag to me right off the bat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and and there's a lot of young guys who try who try to fake things, and just for no other reason than to say, hey, let's see if we can fool them. Yeah, you know, it, it happens. I mean, uh, especially in the U.S., it's it's the, the hoaxing today has reached epidemic proportions. Yeah, it's uh, well, it was just a couple of years ago we had the guy who said he had one in the freezer. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah, the Georgia boys. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, well, I I took one look at the photograph, and I to me, I thought I recognized it right off the bat. It was a very popular Halloween costume from a company in California that sells these things, mm -hmm. as well as other monsters. And they're really high grade Halloween costumes. And I think they just stuffed it with a bunch of guts and stuffed it in a freezer. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, it, 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 anything to basically get their 15 minutes of fame or try to get on to one of these um, silly, or I should say, say, one of these shows. Um, friends of mine, actually, are, uh, uh, we were talking once uh, yesterday, we were talking about uh, uh, Bob Gimlin and uh, part of the Patterson-Gimlin film. And uh, his one of his uh, buddies, Russ uh, Cord, Russ is um, just... I think he just got picked up to do uh, part of a. Uh, he's part of a uh, television series that's coming out uh, on Bigfoot itself. Now, Russ, I've known for a while, and he he rubs shoulders a lot of really good investigators. I've got a lot of a lot of time for Russ. The ex US Special Forces uh, trained. He's a he's a good man tracker, and this is going to work out. Um, uh, well, I think to have him along, kind of keeping everybody else. Uh, uh, grounded and safe they're <laughs> not grounded and safe but uh, keeping keeping the uh, reality part of the show real and uh, cutting through all the bull uh, I think it's called Expedition Bigfoot on the Travel Channel and it's uh, coming out to the end of the month but those guys like I, like I said I've got a lot of time for him Russ Accord, ex-military, he's a survivalist he's uh, you know he's the type of uh, guy and he, and also he's, a, he's pretty skeptical like you're going to have to you're gonna to have to show him that two plus two equals four, or he's just gonna give you the raised eyebrow and walk away. Uh, and those are the kind of guys you want, actually uh, connected to anything where they're out investigating. And good lord, uh, you and I know you don't make a lot of you don't. <laughs> it's like selling books. You don't make. You can't get rich selling books, and you, you're not gonna get rich uh, just because you have a uh, travel channel TV series. Um, you know, keep your day job kind of thing. Uh, now your books. You started uh, what, at what point? Um, so it was back in '89. You did your first one on Sasquatch in Alberta, and I guess that's going to come kind of on the tales of you uh, putting it out there for the public, saying, "Hey, you got a story? Get a hold of me." And uh, what these things start coming in and overwhelm you a bit, and then you realize I got enough for a book, or I've got way too much <laughs> for a book, and what am I going to do with the information? Well, back in those days, before the internet and stuff, in order to get your name out, there was only two ways to do it. There was either uh, go on television documentaries or radio documentaries or publish books. I mean, uh, you could. there was no internet back then or anything like that. So and, uh, Vladimir, the late Professor Vladimir Makotic, who kind of took me under his wing there, he, we kind of became artificial partners, and he did the academic stuff, and I did the field work. He suggested I do one, and uh, I thought it was a good idea. And since no one had done a book about Alberta before, I thought I'd write the first. And the result was the Sasquatch in Alberta, which was put out by a small 
publishing house called Western Publishers that closed its doors after the late Prime Minister, the, the Brian Maroney, brought in the GST tax. Oh, right. My, yeah, my book was the second last one they put out <laughs> before they closed their doors, and uh, you never heard of it again. Yeah. But that book was recently republished by Hancock House just uh, September 2018, so you can find it again. Oh, good. And uh, 1993, I decided to write another one and uh, had enough information that from British Columbia. For every report I got in Alberta side of the Rocky Mountains, I was hearing two or three from the British Columbia side looking into matters, and I was driving all over the place. Uh, every time someone yelled Sasquatch, I was in my Land Rover and gone, usually driving all, like, all the way from from Water Valley, Alberta to Bella Coola, B.C., just to find out the sighting had happened a week before or the guy made it up or <laughs> there, was, there was nothing there. But, hey, I was young and had a lot more energy. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> off yeah. I went. Off I went. <laughs> well, I, go, I go down to uh, the Kennewick, Washington, Washington one, the International Bigfoot Conference, and I meet a lot of people who had reported, you know, they told a few friends and they... they they didn't really get it out in the community that much. Like you said earlier, they pull it back. They feel like, you know, people are going to think I'm crazy. And even though their family's looking at it, I'm like, well, Grandma always talks about the nine-foot hairy thing was picking apples in the orchard. And I see them at these conferences, and it's all the, like, older couples that travel. And they say that it's the only place they can go and actually feel part of a community where they can all share their stories. So your books actually do a lot for other people out there who have seen, whether it's a Bigfoot or even a UFO or, or you know, a ghost or whatever they think, at least they can come out and say it out loud now and they don't feel like their kids are going to lock them in the loony bin. Well, that's, the, that's the, one of the main things and that's also one of the main problems because there are a lot of people out there nowadays with, you know, the internet and stuff who call themselves researchers but they're really... Uh, uh, like I said, inmates run in the asylum, and one of the biggest problems with the potential witnesses, they have no idea who to talk to. Yeah. So they get a hold of somebody, and they're immediately told this cock and old nonsense, and they they get frustrated, and they throw down the phone, click, and you never hear from them again. And unfortunately, these reports, for the most part, never get repeated more than once or twice. Mm-hmm. Me, I'm kind of fortunate. They either get reference to me, or they find a book or something like that. And I, I don't, I don't judge. If I don't believe what they're telling me, I, I, I don't challenge them on it either. I just politely listen to the whole thing, say thank you very much. And if, they, and if they, th- if I think they're lying to me or making it up, which is quite often the case. They just never hear from me again, uh, yeah. and, and and I assume they think, well, that wasn't much fun. <laughs> I won't waste any more time with this guy. Yeah, just nod <laughs> and smile, let him talk, and move. Yeah, on. yeah, 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 exactly. Well, but it's the people, the ones that fascinate me, the ones where people aren't really sure what it was they saw. They saw it only for a few months. It shook them up very badly. They tell one or two friends about it. They're totally crazy, so they decided to shut up about it for the most part. And they, in the end, basically were hoping I'd tell them what they saw. Yeah, and it, it, I find that a lot of people will come out and they want it confirmed by a second person. So, like, I, I, saw, yeah. I saw this, this is what it looked like, and what do you think? And you kind of look at them, well, I can't really put myself in your eyes, but... You know, you saw what you saw. What do you think you saw? You get in that conversation back and forth. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, you've also, your experience, Thomas, you've got, you've got all the information coming into your repository for thousands of reports coming in. So you can actually say, you know, I had 75 reports of of a Bigfoot sighting in this area that month and this person is number 76 plus it, it's a it's leaning a little more to reality than it, it was just it's a one-off on the side of the highway uh even though a thousand people drive that highway every day you're the only one who saw it for that split second yeah. not saying that they they don't see them it's uh at least you have some connection to other reports from the same area that these people may not have 
Oh, absolutely. And uh, you always got to remember when you're interviewing a witness, always keep this in the back of your mind. There's only three possibilities, only three, when dealing with anyone who is reporting they, they saw a Sasquatch. One, they saw a Sasquatch. Two, they mistook somebody or something for a Sasquatch. Or three, they're lying. Those are, those are the only three possibilities. There is no other. Yeah, which makes it a little bit easier. <laughs> it's like when yeah. I inter- when I interview people, if I'm kind of feeling that they they might be pulling my leg, I'll let them finish, and then I'll ask them to repeat it backwards. You know, mm-hmm. do the timeline backwards. You can't do a timeline of a lie backwards. It's you, and they look at you and they stumble and they fart and you look at them and like, okay, please move on. But you can't do a timeline backwards in your head unless it's like it you. have You've written it down, and it's a story, and it's something you've read a thousand times. Maybe you can pull that backwards because it's actually a story. But if you fluidly say that off the top of your head, and it goes on for ten minutes, ask them to start from the ant back and go uh, go to the front again. <laughs> They're all over the place. But if it's the truth, and it's access to memory, it'll just roll off very naturally. Uh, so remember that one when you're looking somebody in the eye <laughs> and doing it. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and if you, you've noticed in, in my interviews, I tend to write down what they said exactly as they said it. Yep, pure version. You know, like uh, Hancock House, the publishers, they, they, they really wanted me to correct their grammar and everything like that. And I, and I really held firm on that. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not interviewing Christopher Hitchens every time, you know. Um, yep. These are people. This is what they saw. This is how they said it. And you need to pour, you need to put it down that way so the reader can get a better understanding of who we're dealing with. Yeah. And um, you know, just so you get an apt description. Because if if you have, if everyone does it like most of them do it, you think everyone was a university professor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's it, not, it doesn't. Oh. It doesn't work that yeah, way. Not, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's a, in policing we call it a pure version statement, and it's the only really way to take it. You start them up, let them go, and then take everything down verbatim, and then uh, analyze yeah, it later. Exactly. I mean, quite often they don't say, "Well, I drove around the corner in this large possible primate, <laughs> and if I feel a motion, cross this, cross the road in five steps." They usually, say that they say something like, "Damn, this big hairy thing ran across the damn road." <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, that's how he said it, and that's how I, that's how I like to to print it because that's exactly what they said. And that, and to me, that's more realistic. Like I would take that guy as a okay, that's the truth. Scared the crap mm-hmm. out of the guy, this big hairy thing, mm-hmm. as opposed to I came around and I saw a Sasquatch who was a yeah. it was exactly seven foot three inches tall, and like yeah, calm down. Uh, yeah. If anybody wants to look and check out. Thomas's website again. That's thomassteenberg.com, and uh, read a few. You you update that thing pretty much once a week, don't you? You've got uh, all sorts of stories coming on there. Um, yeah, and you've got what is, you you actually have uh, from Monster X Radio. You've got uh, some conversations in regards to talking not only what we're doing now, talking about your books. Um, who is Julie? You come. You're on with Julie. A lot of times. Oh well, Julie, Julie Wrench is a researcher from North Carolina in the Eastern United States, and it's her show. It's called right. "On the Shoulders of Giant," uh, talking old timers. And I know she always says she doesn't consider me an old timer, but she does. She, you know, I know she does. <laughs> yeah, I am. I have to admit it. I'm not young anymore. Uh, but yeah, it's "On the Shoulders of Giants," and it's a monthly uh, program that uh, that uh, that she does. And we talk about, yeah, you know, a lot of talk about the old days, because I knew all the old guards, uh, you know, John Green, the late John Green. I knew the late Rennie Dahan, and we're, I was good friends with all these gentlemen, Bob Titmuss, uh, Grover Kratz. I knew them all, and I did work with them all. And uh, and it was basically a show trying to get the memories out of my head so it's at least down, because right. Julie was always right. bugging me to do other book about experiences <laughs> I've had with others. I said I can't write all this stuff down, Julie. <laughs> yeah, Julie. Some of it's it pretty, pretty nasty. But yeah. <laughs> you interviewed that was me, Julie. The idea of the program, yeah. 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 Julie interviews you. She can write it down. <laughs> yeah, you can sign <laughs> off on it. 
Um, and and there's also you go when you open up uh, Thomas's website. There's a little button, little icon. You hover over top of it. Report a sighting here. Uh, are you yeah. pretty much uh, locked down for Western Canada, or is that anywhere? Well, I'll take them from anywhere, but I don't travel as much as I used to anymore. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm not rich, and the price of gas is insane. The Canadian dollar's in the tank, uh, so I really don't go south of the border all much, all that much anymore. I, I really wanted to go down a couple years ago for the 50th anniversary of the Paris and Gimlin film, but I was just not in a position to do it, so I couldn't oh. go. Yeah, um, but after hearing about what a zoo it turned into, I'm kind of glad I didn't. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, I have, the last time I was down in Northern California was 2003. I'd love to go again. Yeah, it would be have, nice. I, I just spent um, June from Washington State to Southern California doing another a bunch of different conferences. Uh, July, I was on a big island in Hawaii in a holistic uh, healing center. Uh, talking to some uh, some ladies there, and then I took August off to ride my motorcycle to Sturgis, and then uh, September I was down in Arizona, Tombstone, um, Sedona, and then you come back and you realize, oh, hold on, for every dollar I spend, I actually spend a dollar thirty six because the exchange uh-huh. rate. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to hover around home here for a bit longer. I'm supposed to go to Port Gamble, Washington next weekend for a ghost conference. And I was like, mm, geez, maybe I'll just back off of that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to kind of reload the uh, the money cabinet, which doesn't reload as much as, as quickly as it used to when I actually worked. Uh, it's, it's that retirement one check a month thing going, oh, come on, we got to get that going. But yeah, it's, it is, it takes a toll. It's, uh, I know what you mean. And if someone says, you know, I'm, I'm just down in Oregon, uh, you come down for the weekend, you can, you know, I got a guest suite, you can stay here. You kind of hum and haw, it's still, uh, actually the U.S. gas is cheaper than ours, but it's still, it's that time and energy to get out there. And, uh, if they want you to go off in the weeds, um, you know what time of yeah. year is it? You're going to freeze your your butt off, and uh, I don't know. It's uh, it's it's a young guy's uh, send the young guys out, ask him to bring back some information, um, and you've got the contacts. You've got uh, I think oh heck, uh, you've got a lot of uh, guys coming up. Uh, you know, even from Oregon and Washington, you've got contacts with these young guys full of piss and vinegar who'll get out and, and beat the bushes and uh, bring you back some some good evidence. And you've you've got to that point in your life, Thomas, where you you can you're guiding these people, so it, it's it's uh, it makes it a little bit easier. Well, it's very interesting, and damn it, I just enjoy it. I mean. It's, it's 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 great being involved in something. There are always two things that I loved. One was the outdoors, and the other was a mystery. So the two just went hand in hand. No, it's perfect. Hey, perfect. And, and you, just to recap, because it's like when I was talking to uh, Eric Von Donegan, he's 51 books about ETs. He's never seen a UFO. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're 40 years. You've only got that one glimpse, correct? You just saw... Uh, of a Sasquatch? Yeah. Yes, I was up the west. It was in 2004, March. I was taking a fellow named John Miles back. He's the uh, caretaker at the uh, logging camp in 20 Mile Bay. And as we were just going down that, that into that large valley where the start of Mystery Valley is, I saw a figure on the other side of that valley on the clear cut where the big, large power lines go through, right at the crest from the center of the cut line and disappear in the trees on the right hand side and like I said my uh, I've always been stick to facts ever need the facts what I saw was a figure he appeared to be jet black in color he appeared to be upright but he was also way too far away to see any detail so I can't say with 100% certainty it wasn't a big odd looking man up there you know, but if that was a Sasquatch, I have seen one. If it was not a Sasquatch, I still have not. Okay, that makes sense. I, I, I've been looking. I've been, I've, you know, strained my eyes looking at things that that appear to be um, humanoid, and you know, your brain eventually says, "Yeah, it is," and then you think, "No, hold on, it's a rock." 
<laughs> I've stared at it too long. It's turned into something that I, I wanted it to turn into. So now I'm I'm trying not to focus too hard and just hope one day I'm in the right place at the right time. And the uh, out here, not too far from where we live, the uh, Chiham uh, Indian Reserve, you know, they say if you see one, it's a gift that you're you're being gifted by them to give you the opportunity to see them. Well, First Nations all along up and down the West Coast here, of course, the Sasquatch is so intertwined with their oral history and traditions, it's kind of hard to separate, uh, um, you know, actual sightings from their, their cultural heritage. Like right near me, just 10 minutes down the road, is the Stahelis Band, or the Shehalis Band, as they're also known. And that's where the name Sasquatch actually came from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, um, in the in 1920s, a man uh, J.W. Burns, who uh, filled in his time as a school teacher on the reserve and became very popular and well known with the people there, and they trusted him. They started telling him their stories and their culture and stuff, and they started talking about this thing in the hills called the Suscox. The best way to pronounce it is take the word bucket, drop the B, and add S A S to the beginning. Suscox. But he used to write articles for Canadian magazines, and he wrote an article that appeared appeared in McLean's magazine on April Fool's Day, April 1st, 1929, titled Introducing BC's Hairy Giants. And he took their name, Suscat, and he mispronounced and misspelled it, and he called it Sasquatch. And it's been known as Sasquatch in Canada ever since. That's how the name came about. That's amazing. I yeah, never knew that. that. That's good. Thirty years before the Americans came up with their name, Bigfoot, in uh, Northern California in the late 1950s. How clever! But Sasquatch, <laughs> basically, the Canadian name and Bigfoot's the American name for the same thing. Yeah, and then then you've got Old Yellowtop. You've got um, like the what was it the Boggy Creek, Creek Monster? You've got a, a, different names in different regions of North America. Uh, oh yeah, all, all kinds of local little names all over yeah. up and down. No, not just First Nation, like you said, the Falk Monster in Arkansas, the Skunk Ape in Florida, Momo in Louisiana, the Old Yellow Top in around Cobalt, Ontario, uh, you you name it, the Mountain Devils and the Mount St. Helens, you know, you name it. There are, there are all kinds of local names and legends. What, uh, what is one of the, the most intriguing reports you've ever got? Well, uh, I got a bunch of favorites, but I have to say my, my absolute favorite would have to be, and this is where basically uh, I, I, I was under a lot of pressure in the 1980s because I was married back then to sort of put the Sasquatch on the back burner and concentrate on more important things, right? And But uh, in 1986, I, I was basically in the bush from late May, and I didn't come home to Halloween. And... Uh, we had this, there was this uh, encounter that occurred in a place called Ballbeard Creek, which flows into the Chilliwack area in south, near, not too far southwest of Chilliwack, British Columbia. And uh, this American couple uh, uh, from uh, Salt Lake City who are up in Canada on a, on a fishing vacation. Well, the, while they were fishing uh, down by the river, all he remembered was looking over his wife and she, and she was pointing back at the campsite with her, or with her mouth, mouth agape, and he looked up, and he, all he saw, he described, was this seven-foot-tall, dark brown-colored gorilla-type thing that was sniffing a bunch of trout they had on a, on a gill string that was hanging on a hook on a tree. And it just grabbed the fish and tore it off the hook and went running through the camp, crossed the main road, which wasn't paved in those days, and disappeared along the banks of Ballbeard Creek. Well, the old couple didn't know what to do about it. They came back up to their camp, and they're sort of standing around talking, what the hell was that kind of thing? And this other fellow came running down and said, did you see that? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, we did. He took our fish. And I think it was this other fellow who I ran into in Chillock who told me what happened. So I raced up there, and I, I went into the exit, and I ran into this truck with Utah license plates coming out with a camper on the back, a red pickup truck, and it was them. So I had been 20 seconds later, I would have missed them. 
and they told me the story about what happened. They delayed their leaving. They told me all about it, and I, they said, wh I asked them which way did it go, and they said it was went over there, and uh, I went across the main road and looked along the banks of that little creek, which I found out much later was called Ballbeard Creek, and lo and behold, in the soft spots and money spots, there were these footprints. The witnesses never saw the footprints. Uh -huh. They never went look. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there was no, and the footprints eventually veered off through the ferns and the grass, and and they disappeared on the edge of a, a large walk slide on the flanks of Ford Mountain. I counted about 112 of these things at the time, and at one point it almost looked like it was malingering around, almost like it was uh, stopping to see if it was being followed. But I never found anywhere where the trail came out of that rock slide area. So to this day, I don't know where it went. I spent three days there and uh, cast two of the cat, cat tracks and took my pictures. And this is one thing now I know. I always carry a lot. In those days, we didn't have digital. We only had uh, expensive film for cameras. And I had about two rolls of 12 shots each. And I was reluctant to use all them all in case I ran into whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the time, but that that's probably one of the most interesting cases I ever looked into. It's known as the Chilliwack River incident, and another one is, of course, is the Crandall Campground incident in Watkins Lakes National Park in the May Long Weekend of 1988, when we had four witnesses who witnessed this thing just outside their campground in uh, late hours, and and they did the rare thing. They went and reported to the park warden's office the next day. The warden was perfectly willing to just, you know, take the report and say, okay, fine, thank you for telling us about it. But uh, after trying to convince them it was probably a bear they saw and failing. But one of the witnesses, a fellow named Gillies, insisted on making out a written report, and he did. And as far as I know, that report is still on file in the, in the office of Waterton Lakes National Park. Well, that's kind of cool. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah, uh, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, you get into conspiracy theories where people say, well, no, if you tell the parks rangers, they'll, they'll just write it off and because they don't want you to know that there's actually a Bigfoot in there or Sasquatch. So it's like, yeah, what, what they're, they're going out there, um, purposely, uh, fool. actually it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a park ranger in California making the fake footprints at one point back in the seventies because he wanted more tourism. Well, it wasn't a park ranger. It was, it was a guy named Wallace who was associated with the original uh, Bigfoot uh, tracks found in 1958 in Bluff Creek. He ran the Wallace Corporation. Basically, he was building forest service roads for the logging industry. Uh -oh. uh, and Wallace uh, there was, later on, was basically admitted that he, he walked around with a bunch of fake footprints Trying just because he was a jokester and he liked scaring the hell out of people. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he, uh, it wasn't he who claimed that he did all the tracks. It was his family that claimed that after he died. You know, our dad was Bigfoot, you know, and the mm -hmm. media ran with said, oh, yeah, Bigfoot explained it was all a hoax by William Wallace. And I said, no, 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 no. The first original set of tracks, if you look at his fakes and his cutouts, don't even match. And at the time, he was quite upset that a lot of his guys were leaving the job because of what was going on. You know, um, I mean, it was Jerry Crew, was a man who was operating the bulldozer, came out and found these tracks around his bulldozer. And the late Bob Titmus showed him how to make a plaster Paris casting, and uh, he made a casting one of them. He went back, and they were picture was taken out of him. He was interviewed by a reporter named Andrew Gonzoli uh, and the, the Associated Press picked up on it. Big footprints found and that's how the Sasquatch got its American name, Bigfoot. It's been known as Bigfoot's out in the water ever since. Jeez. Well, we're talking to Thomas uh, Steenberg. He is a Bigfoot researcher. Uh, has been doing this for many, many years. Go to his website, thomassteenberg.com um, pull up a few of the episodes he and Julie have from Monster X Radio and the, on her show um, on the shoulders of giants. Thomas, your stories are are interesting. Oh, hold on, my dogs. Can you hear my dog? 
Yes, I can. Okay, I'm just you gonna... got a size point on the yard. Yeah, no kidding. I've got uh, just going to make a time note here so I can cut that out. Uh, what are we here for time? Crazy dog. Must be the mailman coming. Oh, it's a little late for the mailman. 46 minutes into. Okay. Uh, let me start again. Oh, I totally derailed my train of thought. Bad dog. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a recording with my dog at home. Good lord. <sighs> Thomas, what do you um, use when you cast your footprints? What do you carry with you? And your big I foot still old fashioned. I, I use the old plaster of Paris method. It's one I know it's the easiest to get, it's the most affordable. There's a lot better casting materials out there, but it costs a lot of money. Yeah. And we have a disadvantage of Canadians. I mean, the best stuff I ever saw and examples, I learned a great casting method from Rick Knoll, a, a colleague and friend from Washington State. He uses a, a stuff called Hydrocol B11, which is excellent for casting material, but it's hard to find in Canada, and I'm not going to drive to northern Vancouver every time I need casting material. You can pick it up almost anywhere in the United States, but in Canada it's hard to find. So I stick with the old plaster of Paris. It's worked for me, and I still use it. Yeah, I, I get the Hydrocal White, and the only way I can get, well, I shouldn't say the only way, but the easiest way to, for me to get it is I'm close to a lot of those prop um, stores that uh, are shops or businesses that sell to movie sets and television sets down here. And it, they use it in uh, building props. And okay. And other than that, you got to order it online. I uh, and that's what I used when I went over to the island and did some casting. But uh, yeah, I, if I had to find that, other than uh, there was one place in Vancouver, British Columbia that had it, and it was a uh, it was a film prop place. Uh, and I got lucky enough that somebody knew where to go get it. Either that, either that, or I was going to have to order it online. And you know, you, you're ordering stuff that just by the pound and paying for it coming through uh, all sorts of customs and freaking duty and all that stuff, so it's just not worth the hassle. Right, and uh, Plaster of Paris is still available in large bags, because when I cast my first set of prints, I was amazed at how much it took to just cast one footprint. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, and it's available, and you can get them in large bags, and it's easy to pack. I put it in a vacuum container, and it's ready to go. It sits in my truck all at all times. So you got your, your camera, you got your plaster of Paris. What else do you take with you? Uh, notebooks, you know, the, the usual recording devices, anything I can carry. Yeah. When you're interviewing somebody, um, well, you, 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 you're, you're standing there with a witness. You digitally record it? You tape record the whole thing, too? I, for years, I've got drawers of cassette tapes of interviews, but I have finally modernized. I now have a digital recorder that I can put straight to the computer, and I like to videotape the interview, too, if the witness is willing. Because the old expression is, you can see it in their eyes, it really means something. Yeah, it does. It, uh, one of the things that, uh, well, again, deferring to my police background, we'd videotape and audio tape it, so you'd you know, have the camera pointed right at the person who's telling you, you know, the UFO landed in my basement or whatever, or, or this happened. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, so you actually, that way it, 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 it brings, it brings the, the uh, interaction with the person back. Immediately, you yeah. look at it and go, oh, yeah, that's exactly, that's the feeling he felt, that's... Um, and, and, and when you're dealing with something uh, cryptos, cryptozoologically, uh, something that's um, unknown to most people, whether it's Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot or Dogman or whatever other strange thing someone says they've seen, it's that that it's that personal energy that they're that's just bubbling out. They want to tell you. Um, well, there's uh, and then there's those who don't want to say a darn thing. Because you have to drag it out of them. Uh, like pulling teeth, but but that energy, you'll know if they're if they're making stuff up or not. I think I like to think in forty years, I've gotten pretty good at recognizing when someone's just, just pulling my leg. But uh, I'm not naive enough to say uh, that I, uh, everybody I've ever talked to has told me an honest and true account. I mean, let's face it: if there is no Sasquatch, and there never was. None of these stories are true. Yeah. And and then it begs the begs the question why, 
why would you tell me a story and you don't tell your family or you don't want to give, add your name to the story? Exactly. Uh, what, what is it you're trying to prove? It's not You're not making money off of it. You're embarrassing yourself in some cases. Other people want to jump up and down and point at it. Look what I've seen. Um, I look at Bigfoot uh, and Sasquatch investigating this way. Why do you actually want to go look for one and why do you want to take a picture of one? It's either you had a glimpse of something and you wanted to say, okay, now I'm confident what I saw, or you've you've got that group that has actually seen something, went and told their friends, their friends all called them crazy, and they're saying, well, I'm going to prove it. I'm not crazy. I'm, I'm going to spend, you know, my next month in the bush with cameras, and I'm going to shoot one and bring it back, and I'll show you. It's like, well, just calm down. <laughs> I didn't say you were crazy. I just said that was interesting. <laughs> You're the one thinking you're crazy. Um, have you heard about the uh, the, the Mount St. Helens uh, story? Um, and yes. this, uh, where the river, after the, the volcano went up, and the river's uh, the, uh, spirit lake basically had flowed away. The, the ice cap, everything, or whatever snow was up there was melted, and rivers had changed directions and there was piles of logs and they had to hire logging companies to come in and pull the logs out. Have you heard a story similar to that? Uh, what, about the volcano erupting? Or you, no, you no. Got it's, a sighting? Yeah, the, the, <laughs> but the remains, actual remains of Bigfoot. Oh, being you mean finding logs. physical remains. There have been stories like that, but then again, uh, most of the stuff in the blast from the Power Classic flow, they were incinerated. Uh, so there isn't too many remains of anything being found. I mean, they estimate uh, about 8,000 elk died that morning. God knows how many deer, black bear, and everything else that was north of Mount St. Helens died that morning. And yet people, if, if there are physical remains, they're probably 30 feet down because the surface is 30 feet higher than it was. Spirit Lake came back, but it's almost in a completely different location than it, slightly than it was, and it's twice the size as it was. Yeah, this... And, of course, uh, poor, poor Harry Truman in his lodge, he's 30 yeah. feet underground. Yeah, he's still in the lodge somewhere. Um, he's still in the lodge, yeah. These were rivers away from the island, or the island, the mountain itself, where rivers... The Toodle up... and like that yeah yeah just uh, through town uh, no i have not, uh, i've heard some stories but i've never been able to confirm on anything oh that's so they're good. just stories you that know was, what i mean someone yeah. they heard something and something happened but when you try to follow up on it there doesn't seem to be any uh trail yeah so i i just dismiss it as another story it's just like the day of the mount st helen someone tried to spread this story they saw the Air National Guard carrying a dead Sasquatch in the net under a helicopter. Oh, big conspiracy theory, you know, that well, kind of thing. That, and that was yeah. that's kind of part and parcel to the story I heard. Mm -hmm. It was from a fellow who ran a tavern restaurant in town nearest where one of these uh, slag piles had blocked up a creek. And the guys were in there pulling it apart and pulling it apart. And they were finding like an arm of a, we'll call it a Sasquatch arm. I found a leg, and they put it, pulled it all out, and the next day the Air Force showed up, or somebody showed up, put them under a tarp, and I had a guard on it until they took it all away. But okay, well, then they're, they're, they're basically seeing the government's covering it up, and I don't buy any of that stuff. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm not into The government wants to keep a Sasquatch a secret. I don't buy that for a minute. Well, it, if, in your opinion, if you have, and I'm, I'm asking your opinion because it's based on research going back 40 years, and in the people you've talked to, if this exists, and you know, I'm going to say it does, just from my experience, uh, because you know, I I did spend some real brain time on trying to figure out whether I was being tricked, and somebody went out and did a hundred and some footprints in the middle of the night. And must have drugged me so I couldn't have heard it. But the um, if it exists, what do you think it is? If the Sasquatch does indeed exist, in my opinion, I think we're dealing with just an unclassified uh, higher primate. In other words, I go along with uh, the ape theory. Uh, people like to say it's more human-like, and I say, well, why are you saying that? Technically, we're a, we're primates too, so we're a 
people like to put us in a different category for some reason, but we're not. And I think the Sasquatch is, it is, is exactly that. It's an unclassified species of higher primate. It's very large, very hairy, and we're dealing with something on the intelligence level of an orangutan or chimpanzee. That, in my opinion, is the most logical explanation for the Sasquatch. Okay, good. Um, you know, I talk, you know uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum's theories of giant epithecus and and uh, things like that. He, he's kind of torn the thing down into pieces, like um, getting an idea of what the jawbone would look like, or the head, or the gait as it's walking, and the, and the foot, and the pad, and the you know different um, different variations of. Of, of it walking, whether it's got the mid tarsal break in the foot, he gets really, really basic or down into it, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's an interesting concept. It 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 is a critter. That's um, I understand it, it is a some being that does exist. I'll be very rare. Maybe one for every hundred bears in any given area. Oh yeah. Do you think they're um, they they're migratory at all? I don't know. I don't believe so because in my in my files you get sightings every month of the year in the same general areas. I don't think they migrate. If they did, I think we'd know more about them by now. I was at a Bigfoot conference. I was looking at a chart. It was a it was Oregon, and it had all the sightings and pins on it. And I, I looked at the guy and said, "It's funny how." There are all the sightings are beside highways, and he said, "Yeah, because yeah. in other words, where people are yeah, people. exactly because he, he looked at me and yeah. said because people aren't driving over the top of the mountain." I went, "Oh yeah, yeah, okay, fine." <laughs> it's now, not- well, you come over to my place when you're in Mission next time. I'll show you my maps, uh, the map of Alberta and the map of the Lower Mainland of British Columbia, and all the pins are either along roadways, lake shores, creek beds. And yet there's vast areas of solid green there with not a single pin. But that isn't because there's no Sasquatch there. It's because there's no people there to see it, let alone report it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it, it was like a slap in the back of the head. And when he said it, he pointed it out. And I went, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> they're, they're not being reported by chipmunks. They're being reported by people who are driving on the highway. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, you've, you've got uh, about how many researchers... A guesstimate on how many people uh, resources you can pull together, uh, you know, basically across North America. If, if you get a sighting of something, can you can pass that on to one of your uh, networks pretty quick, can't you? Oh yes, yes, yes. Like I said, I don't have the energy I did when I was a much younger man. So when I hear something on Vancouver Island, I'll pass it on to a local researcher in the area and get them to follow up on it. And they do the same thing for me, but they hear about something in my area. Alberta, there's, when I was in Alberta, I finally moved to British Columbia in 2002. And, uh, but when I was in Alberta, I was basically the only one. Now there's, uh, there's uh, several very good researchers who've taken up the torch in Alberta. And I hear something on the, on the east slopes of the Rocky Mountains, I call one of them and get them to look up on it. And same thing with Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So at least you, yeah. And do they get back to you too when they, uh, once you've reported? Usually, yeah. Yeah, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're we're pretty communicating him. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Uh, and if anybody out there has a fresh sighting or knows somebody who wants, it, actually, would you take one if it's a couple of years old? Oh, well, certainly. Yeah. Uh, well, that's one of the biggest drawbacks of this research. When you do hear something, you're hearing about it more often than not five years, ten years, two years after it happened. Oh, okay. Right? Well, you know, right, yeah. People are telling you something because they found out about you. I said, I, this weird thing happened to me in 2002. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I do hear about, uh, I really do enjoy the ones that happen within 24 hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, get mm-hmm. on those and... Uh... Yeah, they'll sound like they'd be still going. And plus, you know, you get the per- the person who's the witness, their energy is still up. It's still bubbling. That's absolutely. Um, do you ever do the trick where you, it's not a trick per se, but it used to be when, you know, I was a policeman and somebody is in a car accident, you go to the car accident, 
yeah, some witnesses what they saw, and go back a week later, and it's funny, what they see at the time of the accident is from the contact of the two vehicles together and then after, but if you go back two weeks later, you'll get what happened before the two vehicles hit. Because at okay, yeah, we we actually build. Uh, you'll say, "Well, yeah, this car raced around the corner, and this one ran the light." Well, a week earlier, when you talked to them, it was like, "Yeah, I, I heard the accident and looked up, and this is what I saw." But afterwards, they actually all the other things come together because the trauma of the accident or the event is their focus, and they kind of block everything else around it. But if you wait a week, come back. They'll give you some more detail. Oh, absolutely. As a yeah. matter of fact, uh, mem- memorphosing the account, I've noticed, there was a, quite a well-known account from 2009, not too far. I'm a, I won't give any details because I still think it's possibly a true account, where family was on a trail. And the original story was they were, they were on their mountain banks, one kid, a husband and wife. The wife was like 80 or so... 80 feet or so back she saw this thing charging down the hillside and sort of a bluff charge and it scared the, the living hell of her and she went racing past and the original story all the husband saw was a, a, a flash of hair on the hillside coming down towards where his wife was and he didn't really get a good look at it but uh, if you talk to him later on all of a sudden he's the one that had the great sight and was charged and I'm sure if I talk to him up and down he stood his ground to protect his family, doing Bruce Lee moves with dumb chucks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's exactly. I what didn't I really did. see anything until I'm the one that really saw it. To hey, I'm I saved. I drove off this monster. You know. Yes. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> No, I wasn't hiding in a puddle of my own urine under the truck. No, I was. Whereas actually the original story was she she just drove past and left him behind. (laughs) And he stood there staring at it or trying to get a better look at it. But all he basically saw was a flash of fur because he was further down the trail. (laughs) Yeah, the flash of fur would have been me running. Uh, I don't know what I'd do, honestly, if I saw a came around the corner and I was, like, toe-to-toe with something like that. I, uh, it's, um, yeah, it'd be pretty imposing, something that big. And well, you start, uh, taking, start taking footage of it. <laughs> no, I, I know that. I was, at a, I was in my car, I was driving a friend home, and we had a big sow bear cross right in front of the car. And I had my phone. It was a beautiful big bear. And then a, a cub, and then another cub, and then another cub, and then another cub. And I just watched as these four little cubs, all tagged, had big yellow tags in their ears, like just like Mama, walked across the road and around the corner of a house. And we thought, that wasn't that cool. And we're both looking at down at our phones, like, why didn't we videotape that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. and that, uh, Human yeah. nature is human nature, yeah. and usually a Sasquatch sighting is a few seconds. As soon as the subject realizes you've spotted it, it walks away, and you just see the unbelievable for a few moments. And there's always that human reaction, that few seconds of, <gasps> well, you don't even think, <laughs> think of you. Oh, and then you're afraid, like he, back in 2004 when I saw what I saw, I had a camera sitting there right in the middle of the seat. I did stop, and I did grab it, but by the time I was out of the car and aiming the camera it was gone yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's that that holy crap moment and what did i see was i'm i might did i see that am i sure were my eyes playing tricks on me well by the time your your head processes all that it's gone it's like waving bye-bye and moving through the bush yeah Hey, uh, and I'm finding more and more today with all the popularity of the Sasquatch and everything and all these silly programs and stuff people aren't really reacting uh, in a lot of cases, especially with guys of, uh, of fear or anything like that. Their reaction in a few seconds they see this, you gotta be blank, 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 oh, kidding me! Yeah. <laughs> they were almost angry as they saw this thing. Yeah. You gotta be blank, blank, kidding me! No way! <laughs> well, it, it's, yeah, it'd be a shock. It, it's 
like, did I see this? And and damn it, I'm by myself. <laughs> Who else can I? You get you get angry. You get angry. I'm the yeah. only one who saw this. Who am I going to tell? I'm not going to tell anybody. Uh, if you tell somebody, I don't know. I want to go find it. Should I chase after it? Should I jump in the car? Should I turn the other way? Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, I find the um, it, most of the people that, uh, if not all, everyone who's I've ever heard of seeing one of these, aren't looking for them. Yeah, that's why I really love the cases where there's cooperation. In other words, there was more than one witness. Oh yeah, all the guys on mm-hmm. the uh, all the coal miners on the truck in Cobalt, Ontario, when they saw old well, yellow top, uh, and then in breaking it down, what what is the uh, what is the reason to make something like this up? Hey, Absolutely. Do you do you get the reports of I saw, I think I saw Bigfoot. It was around a tree, and when I went around the tree and looked, it was gone. Mm-hmm. Now, what do you think about stuff like that or these vanishing? Oh, it's it's, it's, it's amazing. People don't understand. Nature plays tricks on you. It's not gone. It just moved away, keeping the tree between you and it, so you couldn't see where it went. I've seen moose disappear like that. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the, in Alberta once uh, near Bragg Creek, we were going through this stuff that was so thick. It was kind of like those thorn bushes you have here, but there were no thorns. But the stuff was so thick, you couldn't take a step without hearing crack, crack, bang, crack, 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 as you're cracking uh, like five or six branches with each step you took. You couldn't avoid it. And we looked over and we see this great big head and full antlers of a bull moose looking out of this stuff and it backed straight up and we never heard a single branch break not one not one sound and it was gone can't understand that another time I looked and saw this large large black bear leaning against the tree and it sort of shuffled around the other side of the tree keeping its feet on the tree and we looked we moved to the right left it was gone where did it go it must have went straight off at an angle, keeping the tree between itself and, and who was ever observing it. And that's how it disappeared. Yeah. It's it's just fascinating how the, the people, like, you know, you get the people who will say, well, there was, um, you know, I see a lot of UFOs activity here, and as a result, we get a lot of Bigfoot activity, so they must be aliens. It's like, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. But to me, as far as I'm concerned, the UFO mystery and the Sasquatch mystery is two different things they are not connected okay yeah we had a yeah. we had uh, I did have a psychic uh, communicate a little bit more on that and that they aren't the the animal itself the Bigfoot isn't connected to UFOs but the UFO had like they send beings to kind of look after the Bigfoot because they they don't want us okay more and uh, one of the reasons, the way they did it was they'd have a thing, it's called an echo, E-K-K-O. And this echo being uh, copies, basically looks like a Bigfoot and stands behind a tree and sticks its head out and waves while the real family is booking it the other direction. So the humans are all thinking, oh, look up to the left, when it's actually to the right, they're, they're flying out of town. Because... Uh, you know what? You are never going to find an answer to a mystery by invoking two other mysteries. <laughs> are you sure now? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I'll uh, go around an endless circle, and quite frankly, a lot of what I call the uh, uh, image running asylum, they want it that way. But they want the, uh, they want it. Um... They want it to carry on as a mystery with never an answer. Yeah. Well, that's the hard part with this. All of these things, if yeah, if you if you actually found one, um, what do you think would happen if somebody said, "Okay, here's a videotape of one at the Seven Eleven. It jumped out of a, a dumpster and went walking down the street, and that was on the news. You had ten people saying, "Yeah, saw what it was, ran off into the bush." I hate to tell you this, but the absolute reality is you could get the clearest video footage of a Sasquatch only 20 feet away that that was ever taken, and there will still be doubt about it. There will still be people saying they must have faked this somehow. There's only one way, and one way only, the Sasquatch mystery will come to an end, and that's when science gets what science has always demanded. And that is a body or piece of the body. Nothing else will ever do. 
Yeah. They're protected to them. That, that is just the reality of it, the politically incorrect reality of it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's just and us being humans. Yeah, we, that's just the way it works. Doesn't mean you have to go out and shoot one. We found the physical remains of one that died, uh, died or one gets plowed by a bus on the Trans-Canada Highway. That would do it. But uh, that is the only thing that will bring the Sasquatch mystery to an end, is when science gets what science has always demanded. When they say they need a body or a peaceful body, they mean it. You know, it's funny, too. You, you know, we say that the, these things are mostly sighted along highways. Um, and we've seen elk, moose, bear dead on the side of the road. Someone's got to hit one of these things one day. I know of several instances where Sasquatch have been struck. They have not been killed. But i got to tell you, one of the things, I, I like to say I'm a 90% believer in the existence of Sasquatch, and yeah, that's about right, about a 90% believer, because I always keep 10% in case I'm wrong. One thing a researcher always has to remember, it may always turn out in the end that you are wrong. You know, and I still think it's possible I don't believe it, but I still think it's possible that the Sasquatch is nothing more than Western Canadian myth and mythology or Western North American myth and mythology. And that alone makes it worth looking into and cataloging. But the simple facts are that uh, if the Sasquatch does indeed exist, one will have to be brought in. That's the only thing that will work. Yeah. Yeah. Now, with see the segments of the car, another thing that... I wonder about, well, so many people have dash cams nowadays, how come we're not seeing any of this in dash cams? All you got to do is go on YouTube, you'll see 500 videos of bear, and ca bear collisions and deer collisions and things like that, but we don't get a Sasquatch. Well, we do get, the, every so often you get the, uh, or actually I should say every so often, I've seen some that are uh, from the police car dash cams. Well, you get, you get blurry objects where you don't really see what it is. So, yes, it's possible. But, again, photographic evidence, if what is on the image is open to interpretation as evidence, it is useless. Yeah. Yeah. We need something Patterson, Gimlin, film quality or better, and even that won't prove its existence. Oh my gosh, that Patterson Gimlin, Gimlin film, um, it doesn't even exist anymore, the original. It, it's gone. I don't believe it does. I don't believe it yeah. does. Some people say they've seen it. I, I, I know of one account, well, put it this way, I had a great reason to believe that my late friend Rene de Hinden had the camera original, but we don't know if it's true or not. I know he had a first generation copy, so did John Green. I have the... I have the uh, thing on DVD. I got a transfer before he died. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, the Patterson camera original, as far as I know, it was in the hands of uh, a lawyer's office in, my, in, my, in Miami, Florida, who dealt with A&E, American International Enterprises, which is a documentary film, documentary filmmaking company that Roger Patterson was dealing with in the early 70s. As far as I know, they still had it in their possession, and there was a rumor going around that uh, the late Rene de Hinden and another and another man went there, flashed Rene's papers about being a, such a percentage owner, and he just wanted to borrow it, and he just never returned it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> or he gave him a copy of it back. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, the camera original, no, as far as I know, it's been lost. Just like the second role that was on loan to the BBC, and Roger never got it back. Yeah, it's funny how they, uh, you know, once they, those places, it, it, and a lot of, I was going to say, a lot of those places, they'll end up keeping um, what, what they're using for a documentary and just assuming it was a copy given to them. But, in, you know, mm -hmm. you never, ever want to give away your original to anyone. Um, yeah, but the, they, they didn't think like that in no, those days. No. I mean, I mean, uh, Roger would let John Green had the camera original film in his possession two or three times. He borrowed it because he was friends with Roger, and he made copies of it. He made a copy of it for himself and Renee. Roger Patterson was up in the uh, Ford Motion Picture Lab in Seattle, Washington, uh, about two weeks after the original film was developed. They're getting copies made. The guy who worked there only remembered a little cowboy. 
<laughs> and he said, before him, the original was a man in a suit. And I assume that was Aldi Atley. And he said, we watched the original film right there on that wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's it's great. It's um it, it is a it's a wonderful uh puzzle. It's an incredible mystery that um mm. I've been lucky enough to grow up in an area where actually or have I been lucky? Let me say if because I grew up here it just is one of those things like, Oh yeah, big there's Sasquatch, Bigfoot. Sure it exists. Have you seen one? No. But it's talked about. It was talked about ever since I was a little kid. So therefore, it, it's just part of the culture. Part of the, it's like a mountain. It's just it is what it is around here. Um, do part I part of our Western identity? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, maybe if I was brought up in another location like Rene de Hinden, and brought here, I'd be a lot more curious because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm I'd be more intrigued. But I grew up with it. It's. Yeah, it, you know, yeah, it is what it is. It's not like, you know, it's like talking to my friends who are First Nations living on a reserve where they look at me like, yeah, of course they exist. <laughs> like, why should oh, we, you know, we don't have to prove it? That's another public That's another public misconception. I find most First Nation reserves are basically the same as everywhere else. You get your core old-timers who believe the old mythology and folk and history. You get a portion of the population think that there is such a thing. It's an ape of some kind. And then you get the half that says there is no such thing. Yeah, I always get the half that actually sees them. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I, uh, I've seen I've seen all sides, even the stay in his reserve where the name Sanford's comes from. You'd be surprised how many people in that community says, "Oh, it's just a story." Yeah, do you find that um, there's those who, uh, in any culture, that um, kind of hang on to the history and the beliefs of the land and things like that, and then there's the kind that are are really affected by Christianity, who look at anything like that as not real and if it is real it's not good <laughs> well I find one of the biggest things I found with dealing with First Nations the first thing I learned is if, if you're dealing with any particular First Nation don't mention any other First Nation because the odds are they don't like each other yep yeah and they'll stop talking to you <laughs> yeah yeah, uh, but uh, no, I find like uh, like I said, deal with First Nations. You get their core people who uh, who still believe in the old stories and the old folk history and mythology and stuff. And then you get some people who say they've seen things. You get other people who say, "Oh, I don't really believe in it." You know, I've heard stories, but I I I don't buy it. I've never seen anything. You know, <laughs> so oh, and then you get your like, oh, I've been hunting. For 40 years, I've seen I've killed bear, I've done this, I ain't seen no tracks or ain't no big apes, there is no such thing. You know, and then then, then finally one day, oh my God, they see something. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, it's kind of funny, I, I was uh, kind of relevant, It's I was on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in um, outside of, uh, just west of Shelby, Montana, um, just south of the Sweetgrass uh, border, or Canadian border. And I was in a little cafe, and I was, uh, and I do some mediumship. And one of the ladies there, she asked me, she says, uh, so you could uh, read cards? And I said, yeah, if you want. So I just, you know, I did it for free. So we sit, and we're just, you know, having lunch, and so I read some cards. And she says, yeah, well, you know, I, I said, do you ever see much stuff around here, UFOs or, you know, Bigfoot or anything like that? She goes, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a pastor here. And uh, at the local church, um, and uh, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. But <laughs> and then she goes off to tell me uh, about driving to work. It was about a, a you know forty minute drive going north from where she was in the reserve. And at one point, she looked over. At one day, there was a, a UFO about the size of a football stadium <laughs> coming up over a rise and hovered. And she looked at it and said, "Oh, that's kind of interesting." So, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't, I don't believe in this stuff, but, you know, there was that one day <laughs> I was driving yeah. to work, and I went, oh, well, okay then. <laughs> but you don't believe in it, but. Yeah, yeah well, it's, UFOs, it's cute. Is, UFOs, that's a whole different mystery, and I could tell you a couple of stories about that. Uh, the most, one I know was a charming lady I used to know worked at the 
at the hospital in uh, Foothills Hospital in Calgary. When she was a young woman, she was a lieutenant in the Royal Canadian Air Force, and she was a radar technician. And she used to be posted to the Pine Tree Line. You remember what that was? No. That was that second chain of radar stations across called the Pine Tree. We had the Dew Line in the oh, far north. Yeah. We had the Pine Tree Line halfway down. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and she was in the Pine Tree. And she told me, look, at three or four times a year, we get these contacts and we'd scramble fighters and the fighters would get close just to have the target zip away at unbelievable speed. He said, that happened four or five times a year. And when we were told to deal with the public is, don't deny it. Just say, yes, something happened, and we don't know. Yep. And people forget, because they're so obsessed with the Americans and their history and everything they published on it, that the Canadian government did a study on flying disc or flying saucers uh, 15 years before the Americans had their Project Blue Book. It was called Project Second Story. And the official position of the Canadian government was all over is, yes, something strange is going on, but we don't consider it a threat to the Crown, in other words, a threat to the Canadian people, so therefore we're no longer interested. And they say, well, why aren't you interested? They say, we are the Department of National Defense. We are not the Department for the Investigation of Strange Stuff. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, that was, that was <laughs> yeah. about, yeah, that was in, like, in early 1952-ish, that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, around, yeah, yeah, around yeah. that time. And we had the, yeah. one of our uh, senators, uh, wow, what's his name, name escapes me right now, but uh, he's always, Hillier? yeah, uh, Hillier, he's always out there saying, we really have to disclose everything we know, and it's like, eh, whatever. Yes, yes. Yeah, I remember Hillier, as far as I'm saying, he was the worst defense minister we ever had. He's the one that brought in that unification nonsense. Oh, he got rid of all the uniforms and put everything? Yeah, he's the one that got everybody in the Army green uniforms. And basically, they said it was for this, for that reason. But what it really was was Trudeau wanted to make the budget of one of the service the budget for all three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. my dad yeah. wasn't a fan of that. He was a captain in the re, uh, Air Force Reserve. and. Mm. To, to, uh, yeah, they got their old titles back and everything now, but... Uh, uh, yeah, it was Hellier that brought in that nonsense, and uh, I think the man's a little bit nuts myself, but okay. <laughs> Which is fine. It's it's good to be nuts and be in Canadian politics. Well, of course. I mean, most of the population doesn't believe in the Sasquatch. They think I'm nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll who show knows? you. Maybe they are right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're right. <laughs> who are they? Yeah. Oh come on! I think uh, and, and I think it's be. What do you think? It, like yes, we have all these weird shows now. We have. Uh, you, well, I'm gonna go right back to the paranormal shows from about 15 years ago. The ghosts ones they first came out. Then you've got um, ancient aliens. That's been on for 10 years. You've got all these other things. So, I, I, do you find that people are a little more um, apt to to report a sighting of a Bigfoot because? They understand yes, there's I something. They're more, they're more apt to report something they've seen, and I think other people are more apt to make up something because of it as well. So we get back into that role of yeah. Now we have to figure out who's who in the zoo here, and uh, yeah. what is what is the purpose, or what is the uh, what is what do you feel is the gut behind these reports? What do you what are they trying? Yeah, to do? You, were, you you remember that show Finding Bigfoot that just ended a few years ago, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I know those guys. I've known them all since before before they ever did the show. Uh, and the only one I never met was the woman, Renee. Um, uh, Cliff Brackman, I've been friends with for years. Uh, I know Matt Moneymaker. Uh, I, know, I, know, I know James Faye, Bobo. I've known him for years. They came up here in 2016 to do an episode, and... I, could, I couldn't believe the stuff they were doing. And I said, why are you doing it this way? He said, and they were honest with me, we are a show. Oh, <laughs> if, we ever found, if we ever found Bigfoot, it would be the worst thing that ever happened to us. This is the, the people behind the scenes are talking to me now, the like yeah. producers. He said, our main objective is to justify another season. <laughs> well, we... That's why things are done. Now, the cast did... They, to their credit, they put their foot down and said, after the first season, said, we will not tolerate absolute hoaxing because there was some weird stuff going on behind the cameras to make things more exciting. And, they, and some people lost their jobs for it because the cat said, we will not participate in any hoaxing. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But they do things on that show they normally would not do when they're doing the research on their own because the show is, like I said, it's a show. They're trying to entertain. It's entertainment, yeah. Well, that's I, I mean, if they ever did a, a show on the Sasquatch mystery the way I think it should be done, it wouldn't last more than one season because the general public would find it awful boring. <laughs> why is he just sitting in a chair? Well, he's doing that. Yeah. Until well, why is he, to go check why, why, are they, why is he looking for creek beds and looking for footprints and actually scanning areas for hours in an old pee? When we could be talking to this guy who says he mind speaks with them three times a week and he, he yeah. habituates with them in his backyard. I mean, come. <laughs> yeah, there's one difference. I'm He's lying, I'm not. Yeah, or the, the, yeah. that lady in Washington State a couple of years ago who caught one uh, eating the buds off her marijuana plants and then uh, she was single and they started a relationship. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. You don't know if that, I want to believe that lady. Or, Remember uh, them? They, she said she was feeding them garlic, and she had names for them and everything else. And she never got a picture of one, but she did take a picture of a stick and dropped. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the stick they had. They dropped it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Here's a tree they walked beside. Excellent. Right. Okay, lady, put put this coat yeah, on. Yeah, it's yeah. only one sleeve. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we have been talking to Thomas Steenberg. Please go to his website, thomassteenberg.com. That's uh, S-T-E-N-B-U-R-G, Thomas Steenberg. And if you pass this on to anybody out there who you know who has had a big, a legit Bigfoot Sasquatch sighting, um, and don't drive, don't drive Thomas crazy with a hope. Well, I saw this thing. It flew in on a spaceship, and it uh, uh, it had a fur suit on. Um, try to, let's let's keep him legit. Uh, he's he's too busy to be cutting through all the fake ones. And no, he's not going to get you on a TV series. Um, so uh, yeah, just just regular. If you've seen one, if you've you've got an inkling that you know saw this seven foot thing hairy thing walking across the street let them know uh report a sighting here uh thomassteenberg.com thank you thomas thank you very much you're very welcome sir Yeah. 